Well, uh, welcome everybody to this mini course on monetary macroeconomics, which is part of the Young Scholars Initiative at, uh, at INET. My name is John Smithin. I'm a professor of, uh, uh, in the Department of Economics and the Schulich School of Business at uh, York University here in Toronto. My co-teacher is Frederick Zhao, who's a possessor of multiple graduate degrees in economics and business administration, most recently from uh, Queen's University. Um, uh, last year, he worked with me as a research assistant on the AMM project, uh, which was funded by INET. Um, and uh, this year, he's been working with me as a co-teacher, actually, uh, in the course Advanced uh, Monetary Economics in the graduate program. Um, at York uh, University. Now, the way we've set up this course, uh, as you know, there's, uh, this morning there's an hour and a half lecture break, then another hour and a half lecture. We've actually split it up into 30 uh, minute sections. This first one um, I've uh, entitled uh, and called it Lecture One for the purposes of our reference. Um, methodological problems in uh, macroeconomics curriculum um, and computers. And the reason that we uh, start with this is that um, later in the INET conference there is going to be um, a, a session on curriculum reform that's going to be primarily um, devoted to undergraduate curriculum reform, which is past due. But in my opinion, graduate curriculum needs reforming um, as well. And if, we're, if that's our premise, and if we're trying to offer something new, we have to identify the methodological problems which exist in what I'm going to call mainstream uh, macroeconomics. And that's our first uh, task then. Ah, there we are. So these uh, are what I would identify as these um, uh, methodological problems in mainstream macroeconomics. And the first is actually the very fundamental premise of neoclassical microeconomics itself, i.e. that what economics is concerned with is barter exchange, the exchange of one good uh, for another good. Um, obviously, if that's your premise, uh, money is inevitably going to take a back seat and credit is inevitably going to take a back seat. It, it's simply uh, the, the wrong premise to begin with. Um, Dillard, Dudley Dillard, um, many years ago, um, nearly 30 years ago, called that the barter illusion. The second uh, methodological problem um, is, which you'll be very familiar with as you've been in graduate school, the virtual identification of the term economic theory with differential and stochastic calculus to solve the um, optimization problems of the mythical representative agent. And uh, John King, in his book, um, called that the micro-foundations delusion. And um, in the jacket copy for, for John's book, um, you know, I said something like this. Uh, um, I said, uh, the illusion has been with us uh, for a very long time, the barter illusion, whereas the delusion is of relatively more recent uh, vin vintage. Uh, together they have blocked the... Um, mainstream macroeconomics from achieving a basic understanding of monetary and macroeconomic phenomena at a time when this is most urgently needed. You've heard these complaints before. Okay, well, we're obviously, um, calculus uh, is the economics, uh, mathematics of infin infinitesimal change. Uh, maybe that goes all the way back to Alfred Marshall's um, motto in the Principles of Economics from 1890, natura non facit saltum, nature does not make leaps. But if you think about it, Marshall's wrong on all counts. First of all, natura facit saltum all the time, as far as I can see. Um, secondly, we are not dealing with natura at all. We're dealing with a, a social science, the ontology of the social world is entirely different to the ontology of the natural world, the world of the brute facts. Uh, on that topic, what's the third um, uh, methodological problem uh, in mainstream uh, macroeconomics? Well, it's the use of statistical probability theory as the main empirical method. 
under the name of econometrics, which is also known as economy tricks. Uh, why, well, um, back to social ontology. The theorems of statistical probability theory simply do not apply in the social world. Um, I mean, Keynes, of course, had made this point as long ago as the treatise on probability, 1921, and made the point very clearly. There's, of course, the famous article by Keynes in the Quarterly Journal of Economics, uh, 1937, and so on. Um, on the topic of the different ontologies of the social world and the natural world, and therefore the different ontology of money to any commodity, I'm, I'm uh, like actually Searle's work, the philosopher John Searle, making the social world. Um, there's also my um, article in a feshrift for Jeff Ingham, which um, I, I, requirements of, of a, it was called requirements of a philosophy of, uh, of money and finance. So we rule out um, statistical probability theory or econometrics. Um, finally, four, the incoherence, I would say, of any and all attempts at deriving so-called capital theory. I mean, the big complaint of the Austrians against Keynes in the 1930s was that they had used capital theory where Keynes had not, but their capital theory made no sense. We can apply the same thing to, um, obviously, the neoclassical theory of capital. Uh, really, any, I mean, all um, theories of capital have, uh, have, have failed. And, uh, you know, we needn't go no further than Jeff Harcourt's classic uh, summary of those issues in the um, Journal of Economic Literature article of uh, 1969. Now, let's stop at this point for a minute, because suppose you're a graduate student and want to have a job in academia and so forth. Um, and uh, if we try to think, well, what is left? Um, well, oh. <laughs> Not very much, <laughs> indeed nothing. Uh, uh, in short, all the, all the techniques and tools and so forth which, um, have, uh, uh, which uh, are suggested and are used um, do not apply. So it's incumbent on us to um, you know, make some alternative suggestions at the very least, and, and that's what we must do uh, next. And, uh, okay. yeah. And so the next thing I'm going to argue, and you'll see this in practice, shall we say, as we go through uh, the course, um, what would be the correct methodology then for monetary macroeconomics? Well, first of all, I would argue use explicitly macroeconomic methods. And, uh, and just as a shorthand, it's the nature of money, the ontology of money, both necessitates the use of macro, it's money which creates the thing as an organic whole, um, and it also, of course, if it necessitates, it also justifies um, the, the macro approach. The second one is to restrict attention to relatively small models of both closed and open economies. Um, now, the reason I stress this is that later we are going to advocate uh, numerical simulation methods or computer methods as one uh, potential way out of this bind. Um, and of course, there are a lot of um, existing uh, um, numerical simulation methods out there in the literature. Many of them are very large, you know, 60 equations, 90 equations. Um, uh, when we say restrict attention to relatively small models, um, our argument is that uh, the, uh, both the um, builder of the model, if you will, and the user of the model should be able to follow the structure. There should be no black boxes where you just push a button, you know, garbage in, <laughs> garbage out. We should, we should be able to understand uh, each, uh, each step uh, of, the, uh, of the course. Um, so, so no black boxes. Uh, we should take seriously um, the notions of endogenous money and bank credit creation. And if you notice, I've called this one of the main collective contributions of the various heterodox schools of monetary economics, the post-Keynesians, both structuralists and horizontalists, circuit theorists, uh, so-called modern money theorists, and others. 
Um, I, I mentioned collective because uh, you may know that there are, at the moment, various claims about scholarly priority, you know, who got there first and so forth and so on, which are going around in the literature. Um, from my point of view, um, this understanding of credit and money and endogenous money has been very much a collective um, uh, um, achievement of these different schools. And, and this is a point we'll be stressing throughout the course. Um, and then finally, to, to use um, this, uh, you, know, you know, what's the final thing? Uh, I've put a slight interp interpolation into the quote from Keynes here. I've put real money value as opposed to money value, as Keynes put it. But it's a quote directly from Keynes' general theory. And Keynes suggested to make use of only two fundamental units of quantity, namely quantities of real money value and quantities of employment. And the purpose of that, of course, is to avoid the quagmire of, uh, of, uh, of capital theory. Is there a better way? You know, is there a way forward? Um, in a book that I wrote a few years ago, my book, Money, Enterprise and Income Distribution, I argued that one way forward was simply to take a step back and return to the practice of um, monetary macroeconomics in the style of writers uh, such as Keynes, obviously, the later Hicks, the post-Keynesians, the people I've been referring to so far. But having said this, does it mean that there is nothing that the methods and technology of the 21st um, century can add? Uh, of course not. And this is where the idea of computers, the reference to computers and numerical methods uh, comes in. What we're going to argue is that non-stochastic simulation methods in discrete time, I put the discrete time in, uh, in um, uh, capital letters there, can provide two things. It can provide a theoretical method that can handle fundamental uncertainty. It does so in a relatively simple way, actually. It simply adds a parameter for animal spirits or adds a parameter for... Um, the state of liquidity preference or something like that. And secondly, um, at least potentially, an empirical method based on the principles of so-called abduction. Abduction is not uh, induction, you know, adding up sequences together. It's working out what must have happened in the past for such and such a thing to have occurred. Um, and uh, uh, we can develop an empirical method based firmly on the principles of abduction rather than induction. Now, Tony Lawson has discussed um, that uh, methodology in his uh, famous book, actually, Economics and Reality. He describes abduction. I myself have, uh, over a period of, what, more than 30 years, made attempts at these uh, at numerical methods. In 1982, obviously, you'll realize the technology wasn't there to successfully um, use numerical methods. Um, uh, the more recent one, um, yes, we do have the technology now and uh, uh, everything's up to date. One exemplar I would like to point you in the direction of is the work by, the excellent work by Wynne Godley and Marc Lavoie called um, uh, uh, Monetary Economics, where they do use um, these methods. Um, that's the, the methodology part. What I'd now like to do to go on to is um, introduce to you, and Frederick will go into some more details about that, the, um, what I call the Alternative Monetary Model, or AMM, developed by myself and Frederick, um, in notation used by the commercially available software program, the EU's software program. Now, as we go through the course, each, the meaning of each of these equations will become clear. So I don't want to spend a lot of time describing each equation at the moment. I'll just go ahead to one. Um, basically, what we're doing is solving for endogenous variables. Um, we've got into the habit of using lowercase y to stand for real GDP growth, uh, lowercase p to stand for inflation, um, small k to stand for the aggregate profit markup. I can't think of another thing to call it. Um, possibly you could call it profit share, you know, at the, uh, at the aggregate level. It's basically the, the total aggregate markup on cost of production of entrepreneurs. 
W is the log of the average real wage rate, and R is the real interest rate um, in the sense of the real prime rate of uh, commercial banks or something like that. So we're trying to solve for these, um, these variables. If I go back to the equations, you can see then um, equation one is just what I would call a Keynesian growth equation, and uh, more of that um, as we go through the course. If you'll notice, one of the big things is that growth depends on profitability via investment function, obviously. Um, the second one is simply an adding up theory of income distributions. The lags are in there because of the time structure of production that we have in this particular model. Um, so number two is income distribution. Um, A is average labor productivity. It's what you have. It's the physical stuff that you have. Um, and it's divided into profit, real interest, real wages. Um, number three looks like a standard cost push, shall we say, a theory of inflation. But notice there's something special in there, the P0 term, and you will discover that the P0 term um, is, uh, basically depends on behavior in the financial markets, specifically on liquidity preference. So there's something else there affecting inflation uh, not just cost, cost push. Um, the uh, number four is not, um, I stress, anything to do with labor supply. I would put it the other way around. It's an explanation of the real wage. It's a wage curve. It's an explanation of how the real wage is determined in the, uh, in the macro environment. Uh, the things to note are this term H0, which we kind of interpret as, um, how can I put it? The, the base real wage, which is determined on sociological, political grounds, you know, unionization, the, the state of labor legislation, and so forth. The other main point is that uh, we've just taken the old Adam Smith argument that uh, real wages uh, will increase in a growing economy. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is a mixed equation um, econometrically. Um, but and that's the reason that these equations don't get used in neoclassical models is because uh, the econometrician says, oh, it's a mixed equation. What do they mean by a mixed equation? They mean um, we're regressing a level on, um, on growth. But the reason that econometri econometricians do not like it is simply because their models blow up. <laughs> <laughs> in that case, it's got nothing to do with whether it's possible in the real world for a level <laughs> to depend on a rate of growth. Of course, of course it is. I mean, Adam Smith's theory of wages was that, uh, was that real wages depend on, on growth. The final thing is an explanation of the real interest. A couple of things to note. Obviously, R0 is, I would say, the real policy rate of the central bank. That would be um, the overnight rate, we would call it in Canada. In the United States, it would be the, um, yeah, the Fed. Yeah, federal funds rate, of course, the federal funds rate. And various other names in various other parts um, of the world. So that's the real policy rate of the, um, of the central bank. The important thing to notice about this equation is that um, there's a negative relationship between inflation and real interest rates. That used to be called in the history of thought literature forced saving. In the more recent literature, the 20th century literature, it was the Mandel-Tobin effect, and it's a matter of huge contention amongst the neoclassical economists. In fact, neoclassical economics would like to impose the other uh, result, uh, impose the other result by putting in interest rate rules which mandate increases in real interest rates when the, um, when the, um, uh, the inflation rate changes. But as you'll see, um, uh, this is actually correct. Uh, this actually is the thing that works out in, uh, in a capitalist economy. Obviously, I've defined all the other variables in the slides. I just want to make a note um, about our MMM um, that what we're going to be using uh, is, strictly speaking, only a closed economy model. Um, however, we have already, we already have an open economy model of the same thing. And so we've shown how these results uh, translate into the open economy setting. 
And just to explain uh, what we're doing, um, in an open economy, an economy which trades with the rest of the world, the key factor is obviously the nature of the exchange rate regime. And as a broad brush, we can identify three possible regimes. Obviously, there can be a floating exchange rate, such as Canada has. There can be a fixed but adjustable exchange rate. That is to say, an exchange rate which is currently fixed but could be changed at any point in time, such as China, for example, has. And then we can have um, an irrevocably fixed exchange rate or a hard peg, uh, gold standard, uh, you know, dollarization in Argentina. Uh, the Eurozone, to some extent, is uh, an example of um, a hard peg. And uh, we can summarize the results that we would get in the open economy quite easily. With a floating exchange rate, qualitatively, the same kind of results that we're going to get in the AMM, they would all follow through um, to the closed economy. We would just need to add results for the real exchange rate itself and for the foreign debt position. Um, an economy with a fixed but adjustable rate, again, qualitatively, the results would resemble those of our closed economy, AMM. Um, and uh, actually, you'll be talking quite a bit, I think, about uh, uh, China like in this context. Um, I just would remark, though, that there's no real benefit for the domestic economy in having um, that quasi-fixed or that fixed but adjustable ex exchange rate regime rather than just simply having a floating rate. Um, the next one, the hard peg, well, that regime is unstable and there are num it will eventually break down. There are numerous historical examples. We talked about the collapse of the gold standard in the 1930s, um, the end of dollarization in Argentina um, in 2001. In many respects, as I say, the contemporary Eurozone is an example of a hard peg. And, you know, it's not really worth discussing that much further either. There are only possible two long-run outcomes. You know, one is breakup. That's one possible long-run outcome. The second is evolution into a true federal state. And in effect, the individual uh, countries become provinces. I mean, there's no difficulty in having a, a federal state with fiscal federalism between the provinces and so forth. Um, and one of those two things is going to happen, I think, I think we can safely say. Um, what else have I got? Oh, that's, this is yours now. I want to just have a look at some of the, um, some of the di uh, diagrams. Um, what we need to do, first of all, is to put in trial values if we're going to do numerical simulation for the exogenous variables and the parameters. And I've called them trial valu valuables, but as Frederick will explain later on, um, uh, they're actually, um, um, they could easily be empirical numbers from, um, uh, you know, uh, an actual um, uh, e economy. I mean, um, many of the endogenous variables, uh, you, you can read the actual results just off the national accounts. So you know what the growth rate is, you know what the inflation rate is, you know what the profit share is, that sort of thing. You know, we can always uh, just Google the number for government spending as a percentage of GDP um, or the average tax rate, you know, and so forth. So these numbers are actually, um, uh, although here we've just, we, we've, we've just identified a plausible economy, which could be Canada but isn't really Canada, you know, you could very easily um, sort of uh, use the, um, the empirical, uh, you could use real world numbers. Um, and then the first thing we do is we just use the uh, computer to solve for the um, steady state growth, which is called a baseline in this, uh, in this world. And as you can see, uh, when we're solving for the initial steady state, um, we start from some arb arbitrary position, what are we stuck in the computer to begin with? There's, um, the model is stable. You can see the uh, dynamics um, uh, of, the, of, the, of the thing, and it settles down to a steady state. In this case, the growth rate is around 3% of this particular model, um, the long run growth rate. I want you to look particularly at the dynamics of the equation, the sort of the drop down and the tick upwards. 
That's because the underlying uh, difference equations are low order difference equations um, and they're convergent with oscillations um, in short. Now we're not, uh, you know, and it's clear just by looking at the shape of things that if you, for example, were to apply a multi-stage technique to this, i.e. change a bunch of parameters at each stage, you could easily generate uh, um, data looking very like business cycles. You could easily generate, um, I'm not gonna say cyclical behavior, I'm gonna say business cycle type behavior. And that's because the um, underlying equations are set up to do that. What we're actually doing is solving for the steady state of the model. The steady state of the model is stable. Now, uh, I think we should give a reason why it is stable, and the reason is very simple, that um, if you go back to, oh no, pressing the wrong thing. If you go back to the um, parameters, if you notice the R sub zero, the real policy rate of the um, central bank is being kept constant at uh, 1%, um, and that's, the, that's what stabilizes uh, the economy. This is uh, what some people have called the smithing rule, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> you know, that there should be a real um, interest rate rule. Um, that's the reason the model is stable. Of course, um, trying to map this model then into the real world is hard because this is exactly what central banks do not do. <laughs> Stable central banks do not stabilize the real policy rate. Indeed, during the period of the new consensus, the mandate was to destabilize real interest rates as much as they possibly could, according to Taylor rule. And of course, if you destabilize interest rates as much as you possibly can, you destabilize the economy as much as you possibly can. Thank you very much, um, the new consensus school. Um, but, but that's technically the reason why this particular model is uh, stable. Um, if we started, uh, if we put in the Kansas City rule, for example, which is just to fix a nominal interest rate, the model would be unstable. Um, if you behaved as the Bank of Canada is behaving, the model would be unstable. <laughs> if you behave as any central bank in the world is behaving, the model would be unstable. I mean, there are obviously mitigating factors and so forth. But, but, uh, but I wanted to make that point clear. And then obviously we solve for all of the different um, endogenous variables. Here's the numerical solutions. And I just want to illustrate, and Frederick will do you know, much more of this, I just want to illustrate um, an example of what the uh, software calls a scenario. Uh, what you can do is you can change uh, each of the um, uh, exogenous variables um, and see what it does. And I've here tapen, taken the typical Keynesian experiment, increase government spending as a percentage of GDP. It was small g, which is government spending as a percentage of GDP, was uh, 0.3. I'm going to increase it to 0.35 in year 15 of our model. And then what are the effects on y, p, k, w, and r?